Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by Jahan Humsmazadeh, author of The Psilocybin Connection, Psychedelics, the Transformation of Consciousness, and Evolution on the Planet. Jahan and I discuss many topics, including the role that psilocybin mushrooms may have played in human evolution, the healing potential of psychedelics, and psychedelic training and education. Also, please be sure to subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts, or subscribe to the YouTube channel if that is where you view this. Also, be sure to hit that like button and notification bell. Your support is truly appreciated. Jahan Hamsazadeh completed his dissertation work on psychedelics in the philosophy, cosmology, consciousness doctoral program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He earned his master's in consciousness and transformative studies from John F. Kennedy University and his bachelor's from the University of Arizona with a major in philosophy and minors in both psychology and physics. Aside from his academic work, Jahan has undergone several multi-year trainings including working within the Mazatec mushroom tradition and is a graduate of the Hakomi Comprehensive Somatic Psychotherapy Program. He assisted the Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy Certificate Training at CIIS for two years and mentored for a year at the Center for Consciousness Medicine Comprehensive Guide Training. He also works as a facilitator for legal psilocybin mushroom ceremonies in Jamaica with Atman retreats and serves as an advisor to psychedelic focused organizations. Jahan leads a free monthly public online group called Developing a Relationship with Sacred Mushrooms with the San Francisco Psychedelic Society. He is also the author of The Psilocybin Connection, Psychedelics, the Transformation of Consciousness and the Evolution of the Planet, which is his first book. Jahan, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. Well, it's an honor to speak with you. I am Mm -hmm. very excited uh, about this conversation. And I wanted to congratulate you on your book, The Psilocybin Connection. You know, I've read a lot of books on psychedelics uh, in my lifetime, and I found the uh, psychedelic, uh, excuse me, the psilocybin connection, that it offered a fresh voice, I think. Um, uh, And you know, you synthesized a lot of material and I believe you pushed the conversation forward in some very interesting ways. Uh, I personally found it very engaging and I think also a very important contribution to uh, psychedelic literature and studies. Um, And so also I wanted to say that your bibliography alone is worth the price of the book. (laughs) So, uh, mm-hmm. so congratulations on that. Thank you so Remarkable much. work, remarkable work. I appreciate so, that. So before we begin exploring some of the ideas in the book, uh, I thought that maybe you could speak a little bit about your journey and mm. what, what led you to these medicines. Yeah, I was suicidal, depressed, and atheist as a teen. Um, a lot of pain. Growing up, my parents were both immigrants and have ADD growing up in the school system. It was very, very tough. And I had a psilocybin experience at the age of 18 that radically shifted my life. This kind of sense of dissolving into a sense of unity with the divine, feeling eternal, uh, the divine communicating, saying love's the most important thing in life, followed by learning. As long as I hold these two values in that order, I'll never have to worry about the complexity of the rest of life. And so I've really kind of given myself over to that path, uh, primarily love and then learning. So I went to 20 years of higher education after that. And after all that time, becoming very serious that psychedelics have been the most transformative experiences in my life. You know, this is after years of engaging with meditation, therapy, community work, deepening into relationships, a lot of reading, a lot of classroom time. Um, I don't think there's anything on the planet as powerful when it comes to transformation. And that's because it really works from the inside out. Like your very sense of consciousness transforms from the inside. So not just the information you're getting is if you're with another human, but your very identity can shift. Um, it's almost as if you're a cell within a larger body and that cell wakes up to realize it's cell within a larger body and it gets to identify for a moment within the larger body. You know, like I am the universe. I am the very unfolding of evolution, participating in this embodied experience. Um, and 
also seeing that they are a relationship with nature. You know, mm. so there's a few synthetics we've made, but these are compounds that have existed on the planet far before the emergence of humanity. You know, they're evolving entire ecosystems together. And so for me, it became a very grounded approach to deepening spiritual experiences, uh, personal development, uh, just awareness, um, power, focus, embodiment, all of it. Uh, I've yet to see anything. And it, I can say as transformative, but my experiences aside, now we have at least two decades of empirical research focusing on psilocybin that really right. seems to confirm all that with 80% success rate with treatment resistant depression. These are people that have gone through all the forms of therapy and medications and have not been healed, but 80% of those populations are actually able to see the benefits and transform their lives. Mm. Yeah, the research is very exciting and it's uh, uh, really interesting. I know I have a friend who has a daughter who is uh, suffers from really profound depression at times. And um, uh, I don't know that this is something that she is going to pursue, but I have kind of suggested, you know, in the past, I'm like, you know, there are these other options. Uh, and I know that there are uh, people working clinically uh, in her area uh, because they're in the Denver area. And I know Denver is one of the cities that has decriminalized, uh, I think, psilocybin mushrooms. That's right. That's yeah. right. So it's say on the psychological and healing component. Um, it's a big word, but it's, I feel it's nothing short of a miracle. And, and I'm using that in the phrase that I've seen plenty of people that have gone through two decades of pain and mm -hmm. the feeling suicidal and stuck and I would say even the core part of depression is a low sense of self-esteem and so self-image. You know, mm -hmm. they've internalized from the environment, whether they be from the parents or society, that they're not enough. Um, and they have a low sense of self-worth. And so it's painful to be a being when you don't want to be that being. Mm -hmm. Every moment is is can be excruciating. As opposed to somebody that really likes himself, existence becomes very pleasurable. And that sense of ego identification begins to dissolve. Um, and I think people kind of come to this root sense of self that we are love, you know, that we're a deeper identity that is beyond uh, this biography. And so I've seen, I, I'm not overstating this, but there's been half the time I've seen people's lives change within two hours, you know, right. that you're sitting there and they're going through this crucial threshold and they are utterly different people. And, you know, I've kept in touch with some of these people for years mm. and it's such a gift to see that process, to see the walls break down and have a rebirth experience. And then there's the other part of, well, why has it took us so long to really find these medicines? Right. You know, like, right. again, I, none of our pharmaceuticals come close to being as effective. Mm -hmm. And yet we have these spiritual, you know, mentally healing medicines that are very cheap, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of finances, you know, you can grow mushrooms in six weeks and have a plentiful $150 to buy you mushrooms for the rest of your life. If you learn how mm -hmm. to cultivate them, uh, they grow on over, uh, and they grow on every continent, but, uh, Antarctica, right. So they're very mm -hmm. available. So mm -hmm. I think it's around the corner, you know, for yeah. our species to like start to embrace these medicines. Yeah. 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 I hope so. I know that personally I found them very helpful as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I, with both depression and anxiety. Yeah. Um, and it, the feeling of that just kind of dropping away is yeah. just phenomenal. And, yeah. you know, the one thing I always liked about psilocybin, uh, the way I've described it is that I always feel like I am in contact with that sense of self that never changes, yeah. that is always there. You mm -hmm. know? Um, and I think that we live in such an isolated and isolating world that connecting to a greater sense of self and recognizing that that self is connected to everything else, yeah. profoundly healing. So, you know, it's, I mean, in many ways it's pure bliss and I think it's underneath what we're hungering for all the time, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, uh, just looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I think the model is very right on, you know, at the base level, we have the sense of, we need security. And if that's not there, we have anxiety, right? right. So that's where anxiety comes from. I'm not safe to some level. As soon as security and physical environments develop, we want social security, a sense of belonging and connection, right? Again, I think that's rooted in this deeper sense that our being knows that we're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Then we move into love and relationships and then self-esteem. We need to feel good enough about ourselves. And so we need a certain sense of self-esteem to become self-actualized, meaning I know what I am. I know my identity. It's solid. And then you move to the last stage, you put self-transcendence where it moves onward to service to others. 
And I think this uh, entire model comes from the space theme that our being knows the structure of our reality at some fundamental level, you know? So it needs the deepest part of our needs by realizing we're interconnected and all on. In many ways, I, can, I think it is the formula that gives this experience of bliss. You know, we, we strive for unity with another human, say in a partner, mm-hmm. right? But when you have that sense of disillusion and connection with everything and the entire environment, family systems, communities, the planet, solar system, cosmos, I don't think it's possible to have a greater just feeling. Mm. Yeah. And these plants, and we're focusing on the plants here with psilocybin. Um, it's, they're part of human history as well. And you make the case, and I want to dig into this uh, quite a bit, that you argue that they played a role in human evolution. And I know that this is an idea that has been around for a little bit. And I don't know if the terminology that's used is meant to be derisive or not, but it's sometimes referred to as the stoned ape theory. Um, And you provided a lot of really compelling evidence uh, to support this. Yeah. I mean, it's a very compelling theory. Um, I, it was first put forward by Dennis and Terrence McKenna brothers. Uh, Terrence McKenna in the 90s wrote Food of the Gods, where he mm-hmm. put the idea well into print. I read that book when I was 19, uh, almost 20 years ago, and I have still not found a more compelling theory of human evolution in the last 20 years. And that includes focusing on evolution in academia, evolution in terms of biological evolution and cosmological and that just of consciousness. Uh, it really, I think it's the most grounded explanation that fits all the needs in terms of there's a chemical explanation, dietary, ecological, archeological, cultural. Uh, we see cave paintings uh, indicating mushroom use going back about 10,000 years in the caves in Africa. Um, the psilocybin mushrooms is the most common mushroom found in the African savannas as the mycologist Paul Stamets notes. Uh, we see the psilocybin ties into the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor within our brain better than serotonin itself with no biotoxicity, showing that perhaps it was a deep part of our you know, human history. We know now, in the last 10 years, that psilocybin stimulates neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons, the brain physically begins to grow. You know, all the pieces fall into place and, you know, happy to go more into the depth of the arguments of the book. And so part of the hope, because I think the theory was again, right on, especially for anybody who's had these transformative experiences uh, with psilocybin, to even think that if our ancestors had these experiences available, that would have been world shaking. You know, I mean, in terms of world creating, you know, Terence McKenna says it's likely catalyzed the evolution of language itself through the process of synesthesia, the ability for one of our senses to conflate with another, including our thoughts to conflate with sounds, you know, Mm -hmm. and then symbolic meaning and pictures and tied all these together and created cultural language that's really been a huge part of the development of our species um part of the hope was you know since his book was written almost 30 years ago so much has happened specifically in the terms of the sciences Mm. and so i was really able to go through everything we've learned and then a lot of other academic thoughts you know and not just in like certain neuroscience but also archaeology you know for example and anthropology and really put the pieces together that i i have yet to come across a standing refutation to the theory, you know, mm-hmm. after sitting with it this long, and I tried to show every possible ex- counterpoint to it. Mm-hmm. And there isn't, I mean, the biggest counterpoint is that this, the theory just hasn't been heard by enough people, right? right? So there's this bit of, of doubtness of, was our evolution really catapulted by what our society might deem as a drug? Mm-hmm. And it's that same kind of thinking that's led us to be blind to it for so long. Mm-hmm. It's just been overlooked because we never even, it was not within our field of paradigm to really even perceive that information to begin with. But now that we're shifting our paradigm, um, especially in terms of the ecology, the ecologies are highly interconnected and evolving, you know, living systems perspective, uh, <laughs> the theory for me becomes very clear and falls into place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes sense to me. And I think personally, one of the pieces of evidence that I find most intriguing and I think supportive of this idea is that other animal species seek out intoxication and altering states of consciousness. And if it's found in other animal species, why wouldn't it be part of the 
experience of Homo sapiens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, our species, for a lot of cultural reasons, I've been to get into. It's definitely the only species that's judged and pushed away psychoactive substances. Mm-hmm. You know, Ronald K. Siegel, he's a UCLA psychopharmacologist, uh, I think taught there for 20 years, died a few years ago, wrote this book, Intoxication. And it's based on 20 years of his research looking at how the animal kingdom looks at psychoactive substances. And he found about 93% of the animal kingdom actually takes psychoactive substances. It was, um, it's so plentiful. He calls it the fourth drive of evolution. So after the drive for sex and water and breaths, uh, food, um, given that the base needs in terms of say, just Maslow hierarchy of, of connection and physical survival and, and the ongoingness of our species, given the opportunity, most animals will choose to alter the consciousness chemically. And that's why there's, I mean, there's 2000 plants that just have DMT alone. I mean, the psychoactive substances are super plentiful in nature found in every ecosystem. And so they must have a lot of meaning of, of what they do. Uh, there's another good book uh, by Giorgio Saramani, an Italian ethnobotanist called Animals and Psychedelics. And again, look into all the different animals and which psychedelics they've been using. And he proposes that they act as a sense of um, deconditioning agents. So, you know, we have these evolutionary patterns that happen and they're very repetitive. And for several hours, once we take the psychedelics, for example, and, you know, they've been notably deconditioning agents. We saw that during the 60s and kind of shift the worldviews and paradigms and our biases. Um, well, that happens to some degree with all animals that the patterns are able to break for a few hours, new patterns are able to establish and develop causing possibly new spouts of evolution. You know, So whatever pattern is there, they're able to see the world afresh with new eyes and new things are able to come forth. So that's one possible explanation of why they exist. You know, but Eddie had been saying forth, we're part of this larger system you know of nature that's been going on the globe for so long that's been using these substances so it's just again we've been blind to it because we've been domesticated ourselves but mostly around just domesticated animals where they're in very controlled environments that aren't you know they're not eating their psychoactive substances because we don't really give them access to it um but we're just participating in this very much larger interplay between humans plants and fungi that's has always been there and is argued since the emergence of our species. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me, this is something that came to mind when I was reading your book, but it seems like this past, I don't know, 1500 years or more that humans have been actively working against their evolution uh, by having prohibitions on these substances and you know, I, I know that this is jumping us forward quite a bit. So we'll come back to mm-hmm. where we were. Mm-hmm. But I was curious, you know, we are in this, this new psychedelic renaissance. And I was wondering if you think that now that psychedelics are becoming uh, more acceptable and being used if eventually they may help us guide our own evolution. I think that's what's happening. Absolutely. On a individual scale and moving into very much a collective, you know, as you people will see in the book, there's so many examples of how they've played huge roles in culture in terms of science and the arts and philosophy. So they've already behind the scenes had major, major impact. You know, you can think of all the music from the 60s and a lot of the CGI and stuff happening, a lot of different levels of technology, even people that have won Nobel Prizes, you know, have been attributed to their sense of using psychedelics. But that's been kept in the background from a lot of, say, main cultural awareness because their legality. I mean, for say, I use psychedelics, especially other points in history, you know, say part of the 70s, 80s, 90s, I mean, could have met very much going to jail. I mean, that happened just for marijuana possession you could have gone in jail especially during the 90s so there's a lot of reason that awareness had been kept back but i think we're entering a point especially that psychedelics are entering through the medical and therapeutic establishment that they're coming to society in a very grounded way that they're going to be a part of the infrastructure you know it's projected medical legalization federally for mdma and psilocybin is 2023 I mean, that's next year mm-hmm. and be just their effectiveness, you know, whether you can see for personal experience or looking at empirical data, I imagine that there's going to be a psychedelic center in every town, if not several. I mean, having so many of my friends are just therapists, and almost it's hard 
to see a more effective form of just therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, mental illness is on the rise in terms of increasing levels of just anxiety and depression. Increasing so much that with the psilocybin studies, originally they were focused on the last 20 years for near of end of life anxiety. People that were about to die, they're terminally ill and they're paralyzed because of the fear of death that they, can't, they don't even leave their house. You know, so they're not engaging in their relationships and sense of purpose during the time they have. One single psilocybin experience freed most of them from this paralyzing fear. And it was um, so successful that the FDA looked at the people running these uh, tests and said, we want you to broaden your search and now focus overall on the general sense of just depression because it's an increasing epidemic, you know? So everybody's on board. There's no opposition. We're not back in the sixties where there's a generation that is scared and doesn't know. And these things are so frightening. It's just, we have decades to build on at this point. So a lot of those people that took psychedelics, a lot of them are the ones in power right now. And so without this, any opposition, people just want it done safely, you know? So there's no enemy. There's no polarization here. There's nobody really fighting against psychedelics. It's just, we're going through the tedious process of making them enter society correctly. Well, that's good to know that there's not a lot of uh, opposition to it. Uh, I I would be very concerned uh, uh, that there might be. um, There's a lot of points I want to kind of address, uh, but just to continue where we are, one of the things that I think was interesting if we look back, you know, our closest period of time to examine would be, of course, the 60s. -hmm. And there was this, I know, debate early on about the use of psychedelics in the larger culture. And I know that Mm -hmm. you had people like Aldous Huxley, who's like, no, we need to keep this to a certain elite group. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, scholars, theologians and whatnot. And then, you know, Timothy Leary is like, no, let's just have a massive party. Mm-hmm. And I know that Leary has been blamed by many people for the negative connotations and the uh, criminalization of psychedelics. And mm-hmm. one of the questions I've asked a few people who I've had on the show uh, talking about psychedelics is if they think that we can avoid another Timothy Leary kind of um, character and outcome to all of this. You know, letting that sit in, it's like there's nobody that has come up in the last several decades of playing the role Leary did of like, hey, everybody, let's just drop acid now, the tune in, turn on, troop out. And I think that even that saying scared people because parents were, you know, they were scared, like my child's going to drop out of what? Like our society, our family system, this is all we know. So that was very frightening to a lot of humans instead of focusing on the sense of our increasing interconnection, Mm -hmm. you know, actually be more proactive in society would have been a very good route. And and I think that was like part of the missing saying of of what he was at because he hadn't gone through that development himself. He was kind of dropping out and hadn't really come back to engage before leading a lot of the youth in that direction. Uh, Terrence McKenna would probably be the next one in terms of who's been the biggest voice and advocates and, and, from my sense, a far more of a deeper, rigorous intellectual than Leary, um, a very different personality temperament, you know, and he spoke a lot during the 80s and the 90s, he died you know, around 2000. Um, but he brought such a complex, deep view. And he also acknowledged how deeply powerful and scary they could be, but also don't let that stop you from taking the dose in the journey. Um, and I, I I'm yet to, he's probably the best thinker I've ever come across, right? So he has a very different kind of mindset. I, I don't know if anybody like Leary would take over the sense of the gestalt as, as, as Leary had. And I think that's because we have so many decades to draw upon. Um, I feel we are more slower moving and a lot more careful because we saw what happened. You know, he didn't at the time. He thought this would just take over the world, wake it all up at once. And it obviously backfired. And that being said, I want to hold the idea that a lot of people woke up on the process, right? So we got, you know, federally moved towards it becoming illegal. But I can only think of all the thousands. It's hard to think about how many people did take psychedelics because of that movement that changed the course of so many industries, you know, behind the scenes. Um, There's a great book um, called What the Dormouse Said that looks at just the yeah, like 1950s, 60s Bay Area culture and how psychedelics played a huge role in the personal computer revolution, 
right? We know so much of our current day technology inspired from the background of people taking psychedelics. Um, so there's a lot of history there. Um, I think we're so much more grounded, you know, and a lot of people are doing deeper trainings, looking at indigenous traditions the ways they had it before. So there's a deep sense in my being like it's here to stay and it's coming in a much more concrete way. That's good. That's, that, that's uh, um, helpful, I think, and hopeful as well. Um, along these lines, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is the trainings. I know that you've gone through quite a few trainings and, um, you know, our alma mater, uh, CIIS, uh, has a certificate uh, in this. Uh, there's only a few others that I know of in the U S I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I think John Hopkins is one. Um, and I know there's the, uh, Institute of psychedelic therapy, uh, in the UK. And I wanted to ask you about what you think the best path forward is. And in conjunction with this is, is this something that should be limited to just trained therapists or can non-therapists also get training? I'm thinking especially about the use of these medicines for spiritual purposes. Mm, yeah, no, that's a, uh, that's a great population to focus on. Yeah. I think there's going to be a wide spectrum of uses for psychedelics and different kinds of professionals that do, are using psychedelics. And I think that's a good thing. You know, and, and for not to be very restrictive, there's almost, I think every week I hear of a new training, there, there's so many that are popping up, it's, it's gaining so much force, and we need a lot of trainings. Mm -hmm. I believe that the biggest um, bottleneck in this movement is going to be having trained individuals, given that it takes years to train an individual, you know, um, psychedelics themselves don't cost very much, you know, whether it be LSD, you can make a lot at a time or the psilocybin, you know, in six weeks, you can be growing psilocybin. Um, so it's not the medicines themselves that are going to be lowering the amount of how, how available they are. It's trained individuals. Um, within that spectrum, I think there's going to be like any profession, very highly trained individuals. And unfortunately they might cost a lot because there's a lot of demand for them and they paid so much for their education. Uh, my schooling alone for masters and doctors is $400,000, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's gets So there's a lot that comes into the pricing, but then on the very other side of the spectrum, you know, uh, the populations that may need it the most with the most trauma, you know, underprivileged people within our society, people of color and so on, um, aren't going to be able to afford that. Mm. Um, you know, just, just as a side note, for example, it's projected MDMA for PTSD is going to cost twelve to $15,000 once it's legalized. And that's going to include three different sessions. And mm. until insurance gets involved and people are able to get to it, like they're not going to have that same healing that I believe is our birthright. Um, so that being said, I helped out with a project called Silo Health to create a free four hour online training, um, just to help people be able to sit for each other. You know, these aren't for people to become professionals and start taking money for this, but because you've had such a big life changing experience, you want to help your brother, your father, right. your, you know, your cousin and so on. And so we need to create a space, I believe, where communities can begin healing each other, mm. not just skilled professionals. And I think clergy, you know, is a great role. For me, the really pinnacle peak of, of the psychedelic experience is the mystical experience, you know, so that's very much in a, like a spiritual context. So I hope they get it on board. Um, a lot of the trainings, it, there's going to be scales are just geared for therapists and a lot of other people are putting it out there to just to become guides. Um, the spectrum is going to be huge, you know, and I think that should all be a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was just, uh, I guess thinking in terms of harm prevention, mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, legitimacy, I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but if someone wants to experience these things and they're not entirely sure where to turn, you know, I can see that. And you hear this about some of the, um, places where people go to have the ayahuasca experiences that there are some frauds and there are some dangers involved. Yeah. You know, so it seems like we have to have something set up, you know, yeah. where it's not exclusive just to therapists, yeah. but allows other people to do this as well. Totally. I guess the first foremost thing I would recommend is to find somebody 
that has come from a, a reference of somebody else you trust, mm. you know, like, Hey, I worked with this person so I can validate them. It's going to be the first and foremost, because there's a sense of trust that's already established. After that, I'll look for the sense of person's training. You know, there's people that are going to be popping themselves up with no, you know, they've done five psychedelic experiences themselves, or all of a sudden they're putting themselves forward as a shaman. Yeah, yeah. And so there's going to be happening everywhere. Um, so then just has a person gone through any training that's relevant to this, I think is the next step. Uh, I, as this moves towards decriminalization and legalization, I think we're going to have a database, you know, online. It's like almost like a Yelp system where people can rate guides, you know, be like, hey, you know, I can verify that this person's true and so on. Um, it's these roles largely exist because it's illegal, you know, and in terms of it's just like drugs themselves because they're illegal. They can be contaminated with so many different things, the substances we take. And as we move towards more acceptance, we can have drug checking facilities you know that can be free to use um yeah i mean i hope that answers your question in terms of you know yeah, yeah. accessibility and yeah 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 yeah, yeah. My, my concern again was just that i don't want to see this limited just to psychotherapists mm -hmm. you know yeah, um, yeah. Uh, because i do think it's important that other people especially in spiritual traditions uh yeah. can act as guides and uh, mm -hmm. whatnot it also seems to me that part of this uh, this movement forward that there's going to have to be a lot of education as well. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking about you know high school kids and how we teach them about drugs. You know, just say no is not sufficient. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. I think that's definitely, from my perspective, the part that collectively we need to work on the most, you know, even when I was talking about like the, the bottleneck's going to be around trained individuals is we're talking about just educated individuals. Um, the entire stigma needs to change. The whole idea of harm reduction is going to happen by more information coming in. Um, this is a big reason. I mean, I'm writing and, and doing these talks is because that's, I think where we are collectively, you know, is, is a need to focus on education. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah do you have any ideas of how that might work is uh other than there's, writing books and doing podcasts <laughs> right i mean there's so much a lot of conversations psychedelic conversations fuel 90 percent of my day right so for yeah. me it's everywhere the bay area is definitely leading mm -hmm. the edge in that place uh I think recreational settings are also amazing. Like festivals have changed so many people's lives, like Burning Man, Lightning and Bottle, Lucidity, and so on. And there's so many talks there on it. Um, in those spaces, there's also places like the Zendo, which is a psychedelic harm reduction center where if people are having hard psychedelic experiences, you have people that are volunteering with a fundamental level of training that can hold space. Um, the other part is playing with low doses you know if you're going to take it yourself it's just micro dosing and so on i think there's a space for deep diving i think is better with a guide it's just you're mm -hmm. able to go much more and just like any other part of life if somebody has acute trauma like a very deep sense of just say ptsd it is better to go to a professional right right yeah. um and it's, it's just like working on somebody's their self or personal development you can sit there and do all the self-work but it's also very different if you're going with a trained therapist that can lead mm -hmm. you in deeper because of their skill set and it's somebody outside of you. Right. So I think it, it would be held in that kind of way. And there's other better priced options like group settings, mm -hmm. you know, where it's not such individualized attention, but 12 people, you know, can be journeying at the same time and hopefully at a fraction of the price. Yeah. I remember, I don't know who it came from. I don't remember who it came from, but one vision that I heard was, of places where people could just go, you know, yeah. and, uh, if, you know, that they can schedule time and yeah. either have a room to their own, but there would be a professional there, uh, maybe do it in groups. Yeah. And also the idea of sitters that you can hire just to come to your house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a quick search online. I think you'll run across some people that are offering those services yeah. on the websites and, mm -hmm. It's great. I haven't heard of that model of like, hey, there's a space you can go to just a trip and you can rent out maybe a room, but there's people watching you. That's such yeah. a different kind of more free form model. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's going to be roles, professions and way of navigating the space that just don't even exist yet. Right. You know, and I right. think there's going to be a, a lot of novelty, you know, mm -hmm. in this area in the next just two years, not given the next five or ten. Right, right. Uh, you may not know the answer to this question, but I wanted to ask anyway. Uh, I know that 
California was on the verge of decriminalizing yeah. uh, psychedelics. Um, do you know where that bill currently stands? Yeah, I was just reading an article about this a couple weeks ago. Um, Senator Scott Wiener is the one that proposed it, and they were hoping to pass it by the end of last year. Right. Something happened within our governmental system where it got put in pause, and they're going to vote for it again sometime soon this year. Okay. He believes there's a 50% chance it'll pass. Okay. Um, you know, well, we all hope it was higher, but at the same time, three or four years ago, never none of us dreamed that we'd even be here right now. Right, that right, the entire right. state would be decriminalizing all psychedelic substances is phenomenal. So even right. if it doesn't pass, I mean, as education awareness is increasing, I mean, we might just be at one or two years after that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And where do you stand on the, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to ask this, uh, the difference between decriminalization and legalization. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I spoke to uh, Tom Hatzis, who identifies as a psychedelic historian, and uh, I think he was involved with the decriminalization movement in Oregon. And he was very adamant about, no, it has to be just decriminalization, not legalization. So, I mean, where I say now, um, we want both. Um, The small differences are with decriminalization, not going to be penalized or put in jail. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But you also because it's not legal, uh, you can't necessarily set up shop and put up a Web page and offer services for money. And so there's still a sense of fear, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, regulation could bring two things. You know, there's a sense of it could be very oppressive, but it also brings a lot of safety. Mm -hmm. You know, we can see that with cryptocurrencies and and, and so on. Also, where if things are regulated, we can have more pure substances. We can have people go and meet a certain standard before they're practicing and. And so it could be oppressive to some, some, but bring a more, a sense of stability. Mm -hmm. Um, I think both routes are completely possible. Um, And we should be moving in that direction. You know, there's this part of us that's like, hey, they should be our birthright and it should be everywhere Mm -hmm. and have complete access. And I think that's true. And I think that goes for all substances. As long as you're not hurting another person, that's up to you. That being said, I also would want like it to be included in the established infrastructure. You know, like that we have entire grad programs that focus on psychedelic use, whether it's mm-hmm. the history the, 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 or the creativity and philosophy that comes for it or learning how to train individuals in the old space. And that's likely not going to happen until it's legalized, yeah. you know. And so legalization will make it accessible to a huge part of the population that it wouldn't otherwise. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely yeah. for both. Yeah. Yeah. I think his concern was uh, venture capitalists getting involved, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and the mm-hmm. negative effects that could have, but I, you're right. I just noticed I'm kind of angry on two fronts because of this, but I, my other alma mater, where I did my master's degree in religious studies, the university of Denver, uh, I was looking at the, every now and then I look at the job board at DU and they were, the religious studies department is hiring uh, an adjunct to teach a class on uh, psychedelics and mysticism. And I was angry that number one, I'm not there to teach it. <laughs> and number two, that they didn't offer that when I was there. I know. You know? It, it's a, I felt it's just, a, I mean, the last few decades, because it was illegal, mm-hmm. was a major loss to our species on, I think, every front, you know, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. Uh, I came in at 18 wanting to study psychedelics. You know, I just had this huge mystical experience two months before coming into college. And there was no route forward. You know, at, and this is 2002. There wasn't very much like any kind of studies happening. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll go into neuroscience. And that was my first major. And I'm like, maybe a few decades down the line, I can finally come into contact and study psychedelics. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I would have taken any psychedelic class, obviously. Um, and that wasn't until there was an expanded states class I was able to take once in my master's. And then once I got to CIS and the movement towards psychedelics started ramping up, I was able to take another couple of classes. Um, but given that I, I mean, I'd argue it's the most fascinating part of life and I'm, I'm biased, but yeah. by its nature, it breaks you through into novelty and mysticism and this huge interplay of consciousness that doesn't seem accessible really otherwise. Um, you know, I feel it's, it's, it's a great loss to us that it's not taught in every major 
you know, institution, especially when it comes to education. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, since I have this background in religious studies and I teach, you know, religious studies at, you know, community college level, I find myself uh, discussing these substances quite a bit. Um, and I always present it, you know, I take it back to shamanism mm -hmm. and that, you know, I firmly believe that that is sort of the Ur religion uh, yeah. and that it has been so influential uh, mm -hmm. and it makes me wonder about all of these religious studies professors who have never had true mystical or religious experiences. You totally. know? Um, yeah. And so I can see it entering into education in a variety of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one, yeah. you know, look, if you're going to teach us, you need to have the experience. <laughs> Thank you. For sure. Uh, uh, and two, to actually just include it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Include them in the conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, as, as you're kind of saying, I feel so much was left out. In terms of shamanism, it's, that it goes back. I mean, there's at least a hundred thousand years of our species, if not a few million, um, mm -hmm. where we were predisposed, you know, towards a more shamanic orientation. Uh, the paradigm was animism, you know, from that perspective, it's still present in indigenous traditions worldwide, that the world is alive and it has spirits and they're just talking to you. Um, in these indigenous traditions, these psychedelics are seen as plant teachers. You're building relationships with their wisdom all the time, even when you're not on them. And, you know, modern society, if we're looking, say, the Greeks now, 2,000 years, agriculture until now, about 10, 12,000 years, right? And a lot has happened, a lot of worldviews and so on, religions, most ideas. But we're talking about like 100,000 years before that, if not more, that was our main perspective. It built the base of our psyche, of our entire culture. And because I think there's a lack of awareness in that area, it is glanced over when it comes to, you know, any kind of religious education. It's mm -hmm. like this was the ground of our being. And it's, it, I mean, it's so grounded in the sense that it's an explanation that it was through the environment that we learned about spirituality. It was through the plant substances around us and fungi that we interacted with as part of our diet that gave us this level of awareness. And, you know, this is far beyond any kind of written word or religious scripture. We're even looking, say, at the, say, the Rig Veda is the oldest religious scriptures in humanity going back to about 3,200 BCE. There's 200 lines of, of hymns talking about Soma, an entheogenic plant or fungi. Right. And so in the Greeks used psychedelics for about a thousand years in, in the, the Ulysses, this this uh, mystical um, ceremony that they would have every year for a thousand years. And they drink this drink called Kaiki Yon that's believed to have almost a very LSD like substance inside of it. The same substance they used ergot, which is the same substance LSD is derived from. So even at the beginning of these large levels of traditions that impacted our entire sense of culture psychedelics were there so whether we go back 100,000 years 2,000 years it, it, it's very much became you know the foundation of the societies we now stand yeah. yeah that's absolutely true and um you know there's also in like the Persian tradition uh, Halma and I think you mentioned mm -hmm. that that had an influence on Islam you know cannabis was also used you know we found graves of shamans you know 4,000, 6,000 years old that have, you know, like pounds of cannabis. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the questions that I always asked is where were these substances and where were these sort of shamanic figures in the Western Abrahamic traditions? Mm -hmm. And it is making my heart very happy and glad to start seeing research and discoveries of like, oh, well, look, we just found this ancient Israelite temple and there's all this cannabis residue <laughs> that yeah. they were burning, you know? Um, but it begs a question, why? And I don't know, I'm just asking if you have any ideas about yeah. this. Why, why did that end? It's a, it's a complex answer. Um, I'll start with the agricultural revolution because historians would say it's like one of the biggest things that's happened in human history and changed the landscape. You know, given about 10,000 years ago, we figured out that seeds turned into plants and trees. So we learned how to grow on food. Before that, we're largely hunter gatherers roaming around in groups of 75, 150 people uh, looking for food and moving forward. And within that paradigm, uh, relationships are what really matter. It's, it's your sense of safety comes from the group. Um, you, it's not material possessions, but you can't really you know, you can't really own more than you can carry, 
right? So it's a very different value system within in that structure. And then we figure it out and then we plant seeds and wait a while, it'll grow entire food. So we begin to settle down for the first time in human history. And this had a massive impact on every single level, you know, population growth, cultural development, and so on. And one of the things it did is we started to own land and started owning material possessions, right? So goods would accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And then we wanted a sense of legacy to give it off to our offspring. So what happened there is men begin to, the beginning of patriarchy, men beginning to own women to know whose kids was theirs. So it could pass on my last name and my entire wealth. And this kept moving forward and forward and forward and forward and created a, a kind of control system that hasn't existed in our culture before. Parallel to this, as we're moving towards the environment before in hunter gatherer species, we're finding food everywhere, whatever we can find we're eating. But when it comes to agriculture, we begin to likely start limiting what we're eating to what we're growing, right? And we're becoming more detached from the environment in general. And this, again, this happens slowly over time. We're talking about about 9,000 BCE, this began. So just looking at, you know, just 2,000 years ago to, to that marker, I mean, we're talking about like a 9,000 year period where that slowly began to shift and shift and shift and change entire cultures and psyche and, and gave us a lot of beautiful things, probably the advent of writing and so many things because we've got to settle down. Um, but as Yuval Noah, Noah Harari points out in his book, Sapiens, mushrooms are elusive. Um, they grow from spores, not seeds. They're microscopic. We didn't know how to grow mushrooms. Um, especially psilocybin ones until the 1970s and 80s when Terrence and Dennis McKenna published the first psilocybin mushroom drawers guide. So that's very recent in our development that we even figured out how to grow psilocybin mushrooms. So mushrooms never integrated into our ability to harvest food, right? And so after a long period of only eating what we're growing, leaving out, I mean, cannabis, it looks like there's a lot of historical references of people growing cannabis, uh, maybe one of the first crops that we were growing, but mushrooms never made it in. And then you have an entire control system coming in. You know, power became so important because you have all these hierarchical levels of development, you know, with the elites and the monarchies, the priesthoods, the military, and so on, that begins to form because of the agricultural revolution. And as we're seeing with politics, uh, people really want to hold on to power, you know, mm -hmm. and psychedelics themselves are seen as deconditioning agents. I mean, you can't really mm -hmm. brainwash people with psychedelics, you know, so it made sense from a very power maintaining standpoint of why psychedelics and su psychoactive substances in general um, were kind of pushed out, judged, deemed perhaps as evil um, by the religious establishment. They wouldn't have been able to maintain their sense of power if people were having religious experience. You know, we, we see this just in the reformation in Western history, you know, the ability that people can interpret God through their own reading you know, really caused a massive war. I think in Europe, about 200,000 people were killed during the re reformation process where people were given religious rights to connect through Christianity in their own way, you know? So if people are able to have their own religious experiences, there wouldn't have been this power accumulation, you know? So this, it's a long part of history of this kind of big falling away. Um, and right now for me, it seems like an inevitable unification back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think you're right that, anyone who continued to use these substances and not just mushrooms, but other psychoactive herbs, they were demonized. You know, I think about the, you know, the alleged witches in the middle ages and their right. flying ointments, you know, they were using right. psychoactive plants, but then right. the church is like, Oh no, that's the devil's work right there. Kill you. Yeah. I mean, if you were thinking outside of the norm from your culture, you know, having spiritual experiences that weren't part of what the establishment was going, you were likely killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that's fairly recent. We're talking about just a couple hundred years ago that happened a lot, you know, and it was like that for about 2,000 years. You know, you'd be a heretic, you'd be stoned, you'd lit on fire. So mm -hmm. if, if pathways had existed in an undercurrent within these traditions, they were not likely not really put to writing and we wouldn't mm -hmm. know about them now. Right. You know, because it was very much their secrecy that now allowed them to exist. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what happened with a lot of these other psychoactive plants is that it was, you know, just a historical, maybe even family lineage that gets passed mm -hmm. down. And so now we're kind of scrambling uh, to understand the historical use and how to use them now. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Brian Morosky released a great book a couple years ago called The Religion with No Name. Mm -hmm. He was um he's a lawyer, but 
his focus had been on ancient traditions within the Western tradition, like mostly Greek culture and Christianity. Mm -hmm. I think he spent 12 years studying the roots of Greek culture and seeing how they tied into, you know, with with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. You know, he traveled over there, went to the Vatican, looked at all their literature. And not only he really kind of breaks down that psychedelics played a huge role in Greek culture, but also the emergence of Christianity. Mm-hmm. And that perhaps Christ was somebody that went household to household with a psychedelic brew, you know, the whole idea of turning water into wine. Mm-hmm. But um, it likely had psychoactive herbs in it. And it existed and happened in the very small scales and little small pods, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and he really breaks the drinks of Kaiki on itself that the Greeks used was a psychedelic brew. It was a drink mm-hmm. that had psychedelics. So that this was integrated by, you know, a very kind of shamanic person within that context that distributed it and shared it with many people. Um, I mean, he, he breaks it down very well at the same time. I think the Western traditions, especially a lot of people, you know, more fundamentalist orientations or literal interpretations of the Bible we now see are, would have a very hard time with that, you know? So there's, there's some force pushing against um, that being said, it could be very, easily cured with direct experience you know yeah, for anybody yeah. who's rationally isn't following the arguments of how these things are really helpful you know find somebody you trust and just take the yeah. dose and 80 90 percent of the time it's going to be very significant and equal mm-hmm. yeah yeah it reminds me i had a student once um i don't know if he was a had been a fundamentalist christian maybe uh, but uh, he came to me after class once and it was actually after having a conversation about shamanism and psilocybin mushroom in the course. And he uh, confessed to me that he's like, you know, I used to be this hardcore conservative. This is his language. He identified himself as hardcore conservative asshole. And he said that it changed overnight after he ate seven dried grams (laughs) of psilocybin And uh, I know that eventually, like a year later, he was, uh, I mean, he was, he identified as an anarchist and he was studying social and political philosophy up at Berkeley. (laughs) So, so yeah, these things can change worldviews and they can change worldviews very quickly. Yeah. It gives me so much hope, you know, in terms of all the transitions our planet is going to ecologically, economically. Mm -hmm. I mean, just by its nature, as I mentioned, it gives us a sense of a deep interconnection. And if you really understand it, there's not much of a desire to be an asshole, right? right. And the, it heals a lot of those parts of us that felt fractured and alone that even created a disposition. You know, even in terms of, say, economics, it's, it's hard to have a capitalist system that focuses just on personal wealth and gain, you know, at the exclusion mm-hmm. of others in the environment. If, if you have this understanding that everything is tied, the ecosystem, and so is every every community, and same with ecological deterioration. And I think a really fascinating point to bring in is um, the role in ecology. Mm-hmm. Um, Richard Doyle, he's a professor of English at Pennsylvania State University, and he wrote this book called Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Noosphere. And for his research, he read thousands of trip reports. And he deduced that the main psychedelic experience is that the participant realizes that they're part of a vast interconnected living system and that they should re- be returned ecodelics. So, right, so they increase ecological awareness. And I think it's part of the ways that the environment's trying to maintain homeostasis, right? It, it's within it, it's, it's creating a state of consciousness that makes it aware, very mm-hmm. self living and aware. And so, one way to see why they're becoming larger in culture right now is that's part of the collective psyche trying to create a sense of homeostasis, you know, with the threat of nuclear destruction, global warming. Economic, economic collapse. This is a very way that chemically, just the way your body does chemically try to regulate itself, that the larger ecosystem trying to regulate itself is by us becoming aware of these substances. Yeah. And that is what you uh, write about in the book. Uh, I think you refer to it as the ecodelic insight, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. 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 So I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about that anyway. Yeah. Do you think that it's uh, uh, that the earth that Gaia is actually playing a role in this? Oh, Um, for me, that's the main context. You know, there's a universal, but it's, it's nice to be more embodied and grounded in the sense of home. And and mm -hmm. I think that's the planet. I remember having a very meaningful psychedelic experience and seeing psychedelics and the term that came up was um, Gaian molecules. Mm -hmm. And, And these are plants that really 
compounds that connect us to the sense of connectedness with the entire planet as a whole. And I think it is wise and, and relevant to hold a planet as a being, you know, the same way we would hold God as a being. I'm coming from a very Wilberian integral perspective that the universe is composed of beings within beings within beings. It's a very whole on everything's a whole and a part. The atoms come together to form molecules, molecules come together to form cells, cells come together to form these bodies. And that chain of existence doesn't end with just us, that we're mm-hmm. part of this larger unified ecosystem, this biosphere. And I think it has a lot of um cognition to it you know uh, some people use the word noosphere and so on but there's a sense of ecological and spiritual development happening at a much collective scale and i think this is the way it primarily interacts with us um and from this sense it's very much it's these guy and molecules almost tune our internal antenna our intuition to kind of lead with a greater sense of fluidity and synchronicity with the planets it's part of the way the planet self-organizes itself and it's because that they haven't been part of our diet, even in very small amounts that our antennas have been off and we've gone very haywire and generally more selfish. And I mean that in terms of being very self-focused at the expense of everything else around us, you know, and what we've seen is that these substances break down what's called the default mode network in the brain. The default mode network is what lights up when we think of me, 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 I, I, I. You know, neuroscientists call it the ego structure in the brain. And it's overdeveloped with people with anxiety and depression because they're in pain, they're constantly thinking about themselves. So that system, that network dissolves momentarily for several hours, which allows a hyper-connected brain state. You know, it seems to act as a repressive factor for the rest of our being. And so when that dissolves, the whole brain hyper-connects and we have this, the whole brain increases in complexity. I think that also correlates to experiences of unity. So people are feeling like one in their body and consciousness, but the brain is also becoming more one. You know, so, uh, you know, again, kind of pointing out that there's ecological reasons of why these exist, but I think very much evolutionary, growing our biology, our consciousness, and our cultural development. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. And the along these lines, you had mentioned animism. And Mm -hmm. it seems like that that is also something that these medicines promote is a more animistic kind of sense of the world, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's not just that we are part of a greater whole. Yes, that's there, but there is a consciousness or a spirit that is there in the whole as well. Totally. Totally. I think whatever route we take we're going to come to the same truth like if people meditate you know we're talking about hours a day for many years so they'll ride the same truth that consciousness pervades everything we're all one you know whether it's through buddhism hinduism through tantra you know through sexual energy people have the same truths um there's so many holotropic breath work just deep levels of high breathing could put you into a very a psychedelic state shift um as aldrich huxley wrote there's this idea of the perennial philosophy at the core of all the mystical traditions we reach the same truths and i believe we reach the same truth with psychedelic states and that's because we're working with the same beings it's our consciousness that we're exploring regardless of the modality the modalities are, are far more insignificant in terms of like it's the structure of our universe and us that it's actually being seen um yeah kind of missed the question right there for a moment but it's just it's a yeah you know in a very similar way though if if i'm looking in terms of about animism so this idea that consciousness pervades everything but on a very deep 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 level you know even use kind of an alfred whitehead framework that even on the atomic level consciousness exists and it's very intelligent and another worry we can see that in the mystical tradition is, is that god is in everything and it's very alive and it's hyper intelligent. And the whole universe is always in this constant flux and flow of, of talking to us. Um, the Hindu traditions, you know, from their framework, um, the whole world is this dream. It's Brahman's dream. It's, and, but within that dream, he is also all the characters called Atman. And I think that's a very relevant metaphor for what's happening, that we're all God, but we're all God within God. Mm-hmm. And within that framework, there's constant communication taking place. And it's a beautiful idea, right? But it's very different to have the direct perception of it. And for myself, growing up in this culture, I don't know if that would have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it took the direct experience of being in psychedelics and seeing increasing sense of synchronicity, meaning like I'm having an idea, then it's happening. I'm thinking of this person they're calling. And this happening hours at a time so many times Mm -hmm. that kind of unlocks a switch in your brain of like, wow, this is, 
This is the way the world works. It's that interconnected and that alive. Yeah. You know, and I think very much indigenous traditions were more connected because of these states where animals coming would have had certain meanings. And they're also much more in touch with their dreams, which is like mm-hmm. a way that our deep unconscious would talk to us. And I think that part of us is also always interconnected with the environment and everything around us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it seems to me that, you know, right now, in the United States, I, I, I can't speak to other parts of the world. I can only speak to the U.S. here. Uh, but in the United States, we're undergoing a transformation in religion in many mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. Um, people are leaving uh, organized religion in droves, you know, mm-hmm. and the largest growing community uh, and the fastest growing community, is, I guess what I should say, are those who identify as spiritual but not religious. And it seems like those people are looking for more spiritual experiences, mystical experiences. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I wonder if there's a connection with that and this reemergence of psychedelics. I would be surprised in the terms of you know, kind of grounding that we're all one mind and Mm -hmm. the earth does move in a very organized way um, that people would be leaving these belief systems and containers that many times they've outgrown. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's very healthy. You know, I mean, ideas get to keep developing and evolving and and so does our culture. And we've seen the restraints and downsides of many of these religious frameworks of in terms of just freedom. We're talking about whether it's the psychoactive use or the way They've seen women or homosexuality, you know, sex in general, you know, repressing like the very life force of our existence, you know, has happened in almost all religious structures. And so people, it hasn't given them sense to expand. Mm. I mean, I, I'll focus on sexuality and psychedelics because they're both so huge and intricate mm-hmm. part of our existence in terms of psychedelics being mystical experiences, expanded state and sexuality being the very creative energy that it creates our bodies, you know, that very much connects us very deeply with other people. Um, so I think it's a very healthy movement. And there's many ways, to, I think, to have like an embodied experience of spirituality. But this is, I think, the most profound and deepest. And that being said, I think just three or four journeys a year is amazing mm-hmm. and a lot and goes yeah. very, very far. If you have that in your system, I feel like you're, you will accelerate at a very healthy pace and in a very sustainable mm-hmm. way. But then we also want embodied experiences. I mean, the drive is there every day. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, so many ways to do it, you know, for me, dancing was huge, like dance twice a week, you know, um, in kind of containers like ecstatic dance for three hours at a time. And I saw it very much as a spiritual practice. I'm, I'm using creativity to move through my bodies and that helps sustain my entire system. Mm-hmm. Other people can be meditation and there's working out, but there's definitely, I think we hunger for deep experiences of connection, whether it's with ourselves and our energy or that with that of others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, my, my practice is hiking, I have to oh, I cool. hike every week I go it's uh, on Fridays, usually I call it the Friday office. Uh, but it's that connection, you know, and uh-huh. I feel I definitely feel like there's something missing if I can't go. <laughs> I, I hear you. Yeah. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and it's interesting in terms of, uh, you know, you mentioned sexuality, but something that came to mind when you were talking about this is the, we're in this really interesting moment where uh, like trans rights are coming uh, to Mm -hmm. the forefront. And one of the things that psychedelics does, I think often is it blurs categories, Mm -hmm. you know, and it seems like we're starting to see, we're seeing, definitely seeing that within Mm -hmm. uh, gender and other identities as well. Yeah. Yeah. I just finished watching again this beautiful show called Sensate. It's on Netflix mm-hmm. and highly recommended for the viewers. Um, it's done by the Wachowskis, uh, mm-hmm. who directed and created The Matrix and The V for Vendetta, Cloud Atlas, just a whole bunch of amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, the two writers were originally brothers, and they went through a transgender, you know, transformation. They were both males, and now they've both become females. And in this show, um, which the framework they use is is that there's eight individuals that empathically connect with each other on the planets and the cross cultures. And they connect through this structure called psycelium, which is like psychic mycelium. 
and they take DMT on the very first episode. So very psychedelically inspired, but they very much blur the boundaries of sexuality, of gender, of culture so beautifully. And as Terrence McKenna points out, he believes that the main characteristic of psychedelics is that their boundary dissolving. So they dissolve the boundaries within ourselves, our psychic structures itself. So that tend to repress us, but they dissolve the boundaries between us and the environment and us and other people. And it's liberating and it's freeing and it dissolves all the way to the universe of like, I'm God, like, right. I'm eternal. Everything kind of stuff. And at the same time, that's its most confusing facet, mm-hmm. right? Because we can't really hold things in place. The boundaries are gone. It's hard to categorize things. So I just finished writing an article right now for Lucid News on sexuality and how it enters psychedelic psychotherapy it should be published this next week. And because it's also, you know, we're where we hit the stickiness, mm-hmm. um, just to point out. So people can have, I'd say half the people I've worked with over, you know, over a period of time, sexuality comes up in their journeys because mm-hmm. it's a deep inherent part of our wholeness and what we are. It's very energizing and it gives us confidence, vitality, restoration, and so on. And so, um, that's also tricky when it comes up between other people in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So there's been cases where in psychedelic psychotherapy guides or therapists have slept with clients, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's nice seeing just having done research for this paper, 25% of therapists. So one in every 20 therapists will sleep with a client over their course of their career, Mm -hmm. right? Because they're having this kind of boundary dissolving deep interconnection of of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, the boundaries blur, including the boundaries that are there for professional reasons. And it's even more likely with psychedelics, you know? So it's a big part of the field right now moving forward is, well, how do we hold boundaries Mm -hmm. while they're also dissolving for the the sake of just keeping things very healthy and, 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 and oriented and stable, you know, when is it appropriate that they dissolve? And when is it that because they're dissolving, somebody must be there to hold that line very strongly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tricky question. It seems. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a good one. I think it's one that we're just going to start now having to yeah. really work on as it moves into integration in the mainstream. I mean, for me, this is one of the main things that can really affect the movement. Right. Right. I mean, it's already been happening for a while where people, as you'd mentioned, go to shamanic retreats and the guy, you know, could be there as a con artist to take people's money. But also there's been a lot of cases where rape's been involved or they sleep with women mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and, and in terms of that context, that's happening across all platforms where people have some sense of power, and especially mm-hmm. in terms of spirituality, gurus have been sleeping with clients, priests, because they're repressing their sexual energy, mm-hmm. it leaks out onto, say, like little boys, right? So that's already happening across all spectrums, I mentioned in therapy, but it can also bring a lot of resistance towards this movement. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think it's a conversation that's going to be more and more having to take place is how to hold boundaries while they're dissolving. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, because, you know, like you said, you know, it the, the numbers that you gave me were pretty amazing. But I know that this, you know, idea of transference between a therapist and the patient, you know, that's yeah. always something they have to deal with. And then to mm-hmm. add sexuality and psychedelics into the mix. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I can see how culturally that can cause a lot of problems. Yeah, and yeah, and it's also you know just bringing in transference. It's also ripe ground for some deep, amazing work. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, you know, transference. Somebody could be projecting their mom or father onto you. Yeah, yeah. And so we can get to the root of the trauma, working it very well. But that also means the therapist not losing themselves in the process yeah. or losing their seat. Yeah. Right. And same with sexuality. As it comes up, we can. The deepest trauma I've seen have been those with sexual trauma especially in early childhood Mm. you know it affects decades many times of the person's Mm. life and so when this person moves towards like sexual liberation and the trauma is coming up Mm. amazing space to do some of the deepest healing in the world and it's also such a vulnerable territory yeah because you could just deepen the trauma or you know in terms of the guide or therapist uh, take away that their entire career Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah. now what about after the uh, the trip experience, uh, because I know from a therapeutic standpoint, integration is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And as we become more open to psychedelics in the greater culture, uh, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, who can lead these and whatnot. It seems like there also is going to have to be more 
uh, I don't know, group conversations or individual conversations to help people integrate these experiences? Yeah, some people have um, stepped forward and given services most of the time for free. So the SF Psychedelic Society has one to two integration groups a week and they're free online. Mm -hmm. So there's resources there. There's Mount Tam integration. Um, my roommate, Brad Burge, is involved in this project called Fireside Chat, and it's a, a number for 12 hours of the day, you can call and work with somebody over your psychedelic experiences for free. Yeah. So if you're having a hardcore crisis or just need integration, there's somebody free on the other line to help you work through the experience. And so we're creating an infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, for it. And the idea comes from, a, you know, people are having just deep peak experiences and then not becoming embodied and moving on with the rest of life or just keep moving into peak experiences without really kind of, um, I don't know the word is embodied, other than through integrity and action, carrying out what they've learned. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very often in these big journeys that we almost get homework of like, go carry this out, talk to this person, heal this relationship, move towards your life purpose, even clean your room. It's come up yeah. for me a few times. <laughs> stuff that comes up really often that people are surprised, a lot of mundane stuff like eat healthy and work out comes up a right, lot yeah. of times on psychedelics yeah. and it's because it's a big part of our mental health, you know, mm -hmm. our sense of vitality. And if you're not doing these things, why are you tripping again? You know, the whole point of tripping is to have a good life and help you create and be advised to, to live a good life. And so often if you not do them, you know, the psychedelic, the mushroom would be like, why did you come back to me? Mm -hmm. I already told you what to do. You didn't do it. And these experiences can be difficult. And in that case, I've seen people have the hellish mushroom journeys because mm -hmm. they haven't learned their lesson. Like, why are you coming back to me? I'm going to make your life very uncomfortable for the next five hours until mm -hmm. you do what you know you're supposed to be doing. You know, mm -hmm. so much of the point is to become a good person all around and, and maintain that sense of integrity. And so the idea of integration is also to schedule time to reflect and contemplate what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe at least two integration sessions for every journey at the least, you know, a few days after and a week after that. So we are not just pulled back into our everyday life, but really take, taking space to take these very sometimes rich nuggets of gold. So we're not losing it. Instead of you just mm -hmm. saw the gold and let it go, you actually get to make it a part of your being, your body, mind, and spirit as you move forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, interesting that with what you were just saying, something else that came to mind is the psychedelics, especially psilocybin, there seems to be a consciousness within it that's its own. I, I refer mm -hmm. to it as the spirit, the spirit mm -hmm. of psilocybin. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have you experience that is that something that resonates with you yeah you know, as a i share in the book some at cis did their dissertation on auditory hallucinations with voices right. that arise right. in psychedelics and they happen to happen the most on psilocybin compared to all the other psychedelics right. it right. seems to be 40 percent of participants using psilocybin had some kind of being or entity say something to them mm. i mean i've encountered so many entities yeah. um and and there's so many ways to hold them it, yeah. ontologically they're like beyond our, our ways of describing and categorizing things there right. seems to be depths our dimension that we just know nothing about mm -hmm. and so where do they live are they physical what's going mm -hmm. on here are part of the collective unconscious as Jung would say and from my perspective they seem very super conscious these aren't mm -hmm. unconscious at all they seem to have a lot more awareness than we do i've tended to put everything within the the category of god Mm -hmm. um in terms of we are all beings within beings but that's a large context or, or right, container right. and so for me when the mushroom speaks i tend to look at it through as, as god that being said there's a lot of ways and i've seen a lot of people you know connect to the mushrooms as mushrooms mm -hmm. probably the one that stands out the most uh, was one from terence mckenna um in his psilocybin mushroom growers guide he has about three pages where he describes what the mushroom is and he's just like, I do this at my own peril. This is what the mushroom said to me. I'm not saying this is true. And I understand how crazy this sounds, but he's like, the mushroom told me it's an extraterrestrial, right? And it's a very different kind of life form. And it exists throughout our galaxy. And it moves around through spores because spores can exist out, you know, in weather, other parts of space. Um, and so what it does, it becomes a part of ecosystems and through this process of psilocybin connects with the living life forms in that planet. And almost through the sense of telepa empathy, it, it's able to communicate within the species of the planet. So a lot of people that take psychedelics, you know, I've had this experience many times where I'm able to 
visit distant cultures very intimately. You know, I've seen the environment turn into Aztec pyramids and all of a sudden become Buddhist temples. You know, I mean, it's very beautiful. We kind of can connect directly to the sense of collective consciousness. And what he said the mushroom says is once we're ready, it'll, it'll enable us to do this with species across the galaxy. We're just not there yet. And eventually it'll tell us how to build spaceships, but we're just not ready. And it's a very symbiotic relationship as it exists throughout nature, because as we learn and grow and develop, we'll eventually take the, the mushroom to other planets. You know, so that's a very big theory, you know, an idea and one way that could seem a lot for some people, but just in the terms of a Gaian landscape, mm -hmm. you know, it's if we look at what is mushrooms slash mycelium being the larger body, it interconnects all the plants in an environment. Mm -hmm. Right. And the largest organisms we know of um, on the planet are mushrooms. You know, there's in Oregon, I think it goes 2,000 acres, you know, right. growing thousands of years old. Um, is this uh, Merlin Sheldrick recently released a book two years ago uh, on psilocybin, on mushrooms, talking a lot about psilocybin. And uh, as he points out, it was likely the first root systems of plants on the planet. Mm. You know, so 90% of plants have a symbiotic relationship with mycelium. 80% of them would die if mycelium solids existed. So it's pretty much the foundation of life on the biosphere. So even in that sense, we're connecting to this large, ancient network that has been here before animals mm -hmm. that our ancestors have always been on top of. So there's a deep earth intelligence with it alone, if we're able to just see it within that context. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, my mind is kind of exploding at the moment. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I read McKenna and have listened to a lot of his lectures. So I'm familiar with his argument about that. And one of the things that I guess what I'm trying to express here, uh, give me a second, is mm -hmm. this, you know, th there's this new paradigm in many ways. But what I'm thinking of right now is that it's going to change everything in so many ways. And what I'm thinking of is, you know, you know, there's this idea of, you know, the hearing the voices and psychedelic uh, experiences. And I know that there have been people who've written about, and even now there are people who are like, yes, and we can have um, conscious contact with extraterrestrials now, and maybe they are ultra dimensional beings or something. And there's one of the most exciting, I think, areas of work right now in religious studies, and this makes me angry too, uh, is uh, actually taking like paranormal things seriously and mm -hmm. looking at like UFOs as religious phenomena. Mm -hmm. and why that makes me angry is that when I was a master's student, I went to uh, someone who I'd been assigned to work with, with an idea of doing that on my master's thesis. And uh, I was stared at like I had three heads and was told to <laughs> find something else to do. But it seems to me that with this new areas of investigation that's pushing again at these boundaries of what we know and it is including things like folklore. And I know that McKenna has brought all this in as well. It, seems to me that we are on this verge of almost like just a radically different world. I feel that. I feel that. I mean, it is so exciting and exhilarating in so many ways, you know, just to take what you said, something that McKenna, he was very big into time, mm -hmm. this time wave theory. And you could, the way it's graphed out is by the increase of novelty, you know, meaning the ability of, of newness that happens through the interconnection of things. And so for a long time, if you graphed it out, the universe is barely changing, barely changing and increasing complexity slowly, slowly. Mm -hmm. And we're at a point right now where it's increasing quick, quick, quick. I mean, several years ago, I mean, I heard knowledge is doubling every 18 months, you know, before right. that it would be, you know, fucking hundreds of years. So, I mean, right. if not more. So, we're accelerating technologically and culturally at an increasing, increasing, increasing pace. And he says it's going to happen to a point where it's going to happen so quickly that it's all going to seem very crazy and bonkers. And that's, what's going to help work the world up. And we've right. seen that I've seen through politics and a lot of the main things that are happening. It's kind of shaking the foundations of what we think reality is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I share your, uh, you know, honestly, your anger, but I, I took two classes on, on parapsychology, one in my bachelor's and one in my master's. 
And I think those classes would be taught very differently now, you know, oh, yeah. seen yeah. such as the outskirts and the weirdo phenomenon. And, you know, and it's just like, also I'm like, well, there's been a lot of work on parapsychology and like a lot of it's very grounded in statistics yeah. and empirical data. And yet it's not taken seriously yeah. in, in terms of it taking in and being okay with things at the fringe. Um, even about five, six years ago, when I did started writing my dissertation on psychedelics at CIS, I had a pretty hard time with my advisors and professors. Oh. You know, I felt like they were being advising me, don't do it on psychedelics, you know, yeah. and at the time, the culture was in a very different place where I thought I would have a lot less job security if I did psychedelics. Mm. And that was like the main resistance I had to move through. I'm like, who would ever hire me as a professor? This is, right, it was right. very different five years ago. You know, um, I, I feel like I need to do this, but I'm also shooting myself in the foot in terms mm. of security. Right. Now it's not the opposite. Now there's so much more security, but I didn't know that then. And the landscapes evolved so much. And given the difficulty I had to move through at CIS to write on that topic, I could only imagine what it would have been like in any other kind of institution. Yeah, yeah. You know, the advisors, the professors would have been like, no, we're just not taking this on. This did not meet our standard of rigorous criteria. Not that it's all rigorous, right. but just because it's all within their framework, they would have just said no right away. So yeah. we've had to fight very hard to be where we are. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And that's why I'm so grateful for the work uh, that you've done. And, you know, in terms of religious studies, uh, Jeffrey Kripal, I think he's at Rice University. Uh, he has really pushed the borders uh, in terms of uh, what's acceptable areas of examination and research. And he's like, mm. we have to take these things seriously. If we're studying religion, you have to, if you don't, you know, you're missing a huge chunk of human experience and phenomena. Yeah. You know, absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. You know, some of the stuff that really gets to, it's like, we don't know how we got here and who we are and what we're growing, like the major existential stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We're still, you know, and I think losing that framework, the religious or spiritual framework, we're really losing the goal, like the main right. reasons, so like the main yeah. answers to those questions, for sure. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. It seems like one of the things that needs to be addressed in terms of education and how the psychedelic renaissance is going to play out is also going to be in philosophy. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was the field I decided to focus on. You know, I mean, I got my bachelor's there and my doctor's in it and so many ways to look at it because it's such an internal love. Like mm. if there was any topic field growing up, even as a teenager, I could have focused on it would have been philosophy. That being said, depending on the paradigm it's coming from, it could be very dry. Right. Yeah. So it's coming from a very reductionistic materialistic standpoint. It's just like, there's nothing really a substance going on here. Mm. It's just people just breaking things down into logic, even though the stuff itself might not be that interesting. Uh, that being said, it's just, like, I think, in the realm of thought, you know, of creativity, it's, it's incomparable what these psychedelics can do to anything else, mm -hmm. you know, because it's directly shifting the apparatus through which we're learning and seeing and perceiving. Um, and there's been some good work on this. Um, you know, one notable one stands out for me a lot is Christopher Bache. He mm -hmm. wrote a couple right. of books that really stand out. Uh, what Dark Night, Early Dawn, and more recently, LST and Mind of the Universe. And he was a professor of religion and philosophy for 30 years at Youngstown University. And while he's doing there, studying transpersonal theory and teaching it, for a couple, just two decades, he was doing high dose LSD work based on the, you know, the model Stanislav Grof was using. So he would take about 500 mics, which is about five doses of LSD, do a deep dive you know, once a month. And I can only imagine the line he was skating because he'd be coming to the classrooms teaching religion and philosophy and not being able to reference his LSD journeys, which were the most impactful experiences of his life. Mm -hmm. And he waited almost a decade after these two decades to really release the big first volume, um, Dark Night, Early Dawn, that goes through it and, and looking at it from a very much philosophical and religious lens. And then took another decade before coming out with LSD in the Mind of the Universe. And he definitely makes a strong argument that these can be used for philosophical inquiry. There's another writer, it's Peter... I'm the say his, it's Scandinavian name. It's Jay Stomach. I'm going to say his name wrong because it's a different kind mm -hmm. of a, a language. Um, but he wrote this book, Noomics, you know, based on psychedelics, meta ethics, and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And he's also says that these can be amazing instruments for the field of philosophy. And he calls them like sci fed, where it's almost like phenomenological experiences, you know, of our connectedness by using psychedelics. And 
he definitely says us philosophers not using psychedelics is almost God, not using God's greatest tool for the subject. Mm. And he looks at Whitehead, Kant, and the entire Nietzsche through this large development through the psychedelic lens. And so I think he's doing great work there. It's, he's in Europe. And I think he he's teaching, I don't know, he's teaching on psychedelics right now, but he's a professor of philosophy over there. Mm. Um, I feel like so many fields could gain so much from it. And right. it's for me, that's like my little golden one. I wish does, you know, just because it really does focus so much on the growth of thoughts. There's so many right. practical applications to the rest of the fields, mm -hmm. but this one is purely just for the sake of learning. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, I always say, I, I, I well, one, I, I, had Chris Bache on as a guest uh, and oh, I love cool. speaking with him and uh, he's been an inspiration uh, as well. And I can't imagine what it was like to have to be in the psychedelic closet uh, all those years and uh, not be able to discuss it. And, you know, I walk a really fine line with when I'm in the classroom, um, I will usually, if students ask, I will be honest, but always speak in the past tense. Uh, yes, it, ha <laughs> yeah, it happened in the past, you know, that's when right. I was much younger. Right. Um, but I feel it's important to own up to it. Um, and I have a little talk that I give them. I'm like, you know, because I think that, you know, just say no, is stupid. It's never going to work. So if you were to do these things, here's, you know, some, some things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, but just in terms of philosophy in general, you know, I always go back to William James and you know, the varieties of religious experience in that chapter he has on mysticism, where he's talking about his, uh, the nitrous oxide experience he has, yeah. you know, and he's like, uh, you know, any account of the universe that doesn't take these sorts of experiences seriously is incomplete. Yeah. 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 I definitely feel in terms of nitrous oxide, you know, Will James's experience and just to throw a background, people were he says the first time he ever, you know, understood Hegel, Hegel and, and saw like the non-duality of all, you know, the coming together of all contradictions was because of nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. And in my own life, nitrous oxide has played an enormous and beautiful role. The first time I ever felt the sense of wholeness and it stayed was nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. You know, it's completely shifted and healed my being. And as a also a caveat to put out there, those I've also learned it's addictive. It hits opiate receptors mm -hmm. on the brain while also being a psychedelic. You know, so there's ways to move with it towards caution, but I think it's very underutilized. And that substance itself, you know, if we can look at if the ecosystem the psychedelic grows from says anything about it, you know, mushrooms break down, decompose matter because it's underground and so on, and ayahuasca is in the rainforest. Nitrous oxide, two parts nitrogen, one part oxygen, it's very simple, uh, is a byproduct of biological matter processes coming out of the ocean and people, but it's very light, so it floats. Mm -hmm. and it creates 70 percent of our stratosphere so it's the main place of nitrous oxide is way up in the upper atmospheres and it tends to give you this kind of bird's eye view perspective mm -hmm. you know if a lot of people come say like instant nirvana for 20 or 30 seconds and then it goes away okay. you know it's a state you can stay in again there's a lot of things to look at um mm -hmm. because it can be have other side effects like uh decreasing the b12 in your body for example mm -hmm. but i think it's a very underutilized profound medicine kind of going back to medicine here, you mentioned the addiction and we have this addictive, you know, a crisis of addiction, mm -hmm. uh, especially with opioids. It, it seems to me that this is another area that psychedelics can help us with because mm -hmm. they're not addictive. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't know if they can help with physical pain. I think to some extent they can, but there has been evidence showing that they do help with addiction, right? Yeah, absolutely. There is. Yeah. So I think part of our growth is realizing that all drugs aren't the same. I think a lot right. of culture kind of put them all together. And, you know, I remember going through just introduction psychology 101. It's just like there's six main classes right, and that's right, one way right. to break it down. And within psychedelics, there's other families, you know, so it's nice mm -hmm. to see that the nuances and differences, you know, no totally the ones are the tryptamines um, based kind of on serotonin and the DMT structure. And that includes psilocybin, LSD, DMT, 5-MeO, DMT. Uh, so that includes ayahuasca uses DMT. So like a lot of the big ones are there. Then there's the phenethylamines are like um, mescaline and MDMA and so on. Uh, ketamine is on its own and then nitrous oxide would be on its own, right? And so that being said, the tryptamines themselves seem to be very anti-addictive. 
and break compulsive behavior. You know, people don't necessarily want to take mushrooms and have a big dose the next day. And there's this huge tolerance build up. So if you wanted to take mushrooms the next day, you almost need double the amount. The third day, almost quadruple. By the fourth day, it'll, it just stops working. You know, if we go to Burning Man, a lot of people are taking LSD that week. You know, by day five, six, seven, you're taking 10 minutes of LSD and nothing is happening. So mm-hmm. it, it's built into the mechanism that it can't be addictive. Um, and if you have a really good dose, you're really satisfied for a very long time. You know, I LSD, mushrooms, I can't even tell you how much they've changed my life. And I only do them a few times a year. Mm. You know, it's not like you go do these things every weekend. That being said, I I think it's worth pointing out, uh, ketamine and nitrous can be very addicting, Mm -hmm. you know, and they can be very profound in healing. So we're skating a new line in that territory. Mm -hmm. Um, But but when it comes to coming over addiction, um, studies have been done on nicotine addiction and alcohol addiction using psilocybin, also about 80% success rate. And when it comes to opiate abuse, I mean, iboga has been really big for that. I think a you know, high level of success rate also. So these tend to break these uh, contrived uh, controlling patterns. You know, it even helps with OCD, people that have to stay in control all the time. It tends to break those parts of us and relax our body, bring a deeper sense of peace and fulfillment, which is what's underneath the addiction. You know, there's been, Gabor Moth has done great work on addiction. Um, and he really breaks down that there's a correlation between addiction and childhood trauma. So if you heal the underlying trauma, generally the addictions themselves tend to go away. Right. Right. You know, the thing that I always kind of come back to is that I think that we're all traumatized (laughs) one way or another. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, I I do accept the uh, first noble truth of Buddhism that, you know, there is suffering. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I always kind of summarize it as, you know, we all suffer, we're all broken, and we all have healing to do. Yeah. And it seems like these substances are here and coming at a very important time to help us heal. Yeah. And the world seems to be in desperate need of healing. Oh, right. Yeah. And I, you've already answered this question in a sense, but I'm going to ask it to you directly uh, because I know mm-hmm. we're running out of time. Uh, and I've asked this to a few people, uh, especially in context of, uh, like the climate emergency and whatnot. Um, but given the state of the world, are, are you hopeful? Oh yeah. Very, very, very. It's, I love the question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I would be without my psychedelic experiences, mm-hmm. you know, to be honest, it's just, there's been so much profound experiences and almost into this unification of heaven. And, and what I mean that it's also that it's like, we're like the way that egg corn eventually turns into a tree. Like we are moving towards this more, unified state of being that the whole planet is moving towards and that's when the planets actualize that's more of the place we're going to be and so that's that's just its destination and there's a lot of difficulties on the way so having a felt embodied experience a kind of visionary experience of that has really been the best resources of my life and i remember under a high dose lsd journey kind of contacting what felt like the multiplicity and intelligence of our planet you know the planet itself saying like it's all going according to plan all these difficulties, whether at the time it was like the Trump presidency or the ecological devastation, it's like, this is kind of scripted. This is there also to increase healing and growth. You know, the eco- ecological challenges that we're facing, I mean, what bigger way to grow, spur just development of consciousness, even though it's, it's very painful and difficult because we are realizing interconnection is true on a very deep level and we need to wise up and grow. And, you know, people, you know, the millennial generation, it's like, we grew up going to school since second grade, knowing this is like a fact and that the world we live in isn't it's, it's finite and it's going to be very difficult and painful. And so we've had to really grow the fuck up very fast. We don't have this way other generations of like the resources are limitless and that we can go on forever, you know? So um, I think it's spurring growth. You know, we can look at Greta Thunberg at such a young age Mm -hmm. becoming not say a martyr, but like leaving her entire life and school systems to just focus on this. I think it's, it's spurring and uniting us. You know, the whole ideas of boundaries and culture is also dissolving because of that, mm-hmm. of like, no, we we're, we need to do all this together. Um, I think it's forcing us to become deeper humans in terms of a, like a planetary citizen and there's a deeper truth. So I, I think there's a lot of growth from it. I think we're absolutely going to make it through. That being said, that's not to take away all the pain. Mm-hmm. You know, being here in California, the last few summers have been hard and just mm-hmm. like, 
shattering just like wow like it's just been in some days where the like, everything's clouded in smoke and cities nearby are burning down you know entire lives are being erased and the wildlife the plants and the i mean it's going to be happening across the planet so there's going to be major transitions and challenges coming so that's often to say it's going to be very difficult in the coming decades that's right. true and yes we're going to make it through not all yeah. of us that's a hard part but as right, a culture right, right. and as a species yes and i think it's going to be growing pains and it'll serve a beautiful purpose um and not to take away from the actual direct experience of suffering many people are going to be going through. Yeah, for sure. And Chris Bache, I think, says something very similar about that, that, very you know, much. there's, we, we're going to have to go through the pain, but there is, and not all of us are going to make it, but <laughs> there is, there is another end to it. Right. Totally. Totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. So uh, your book uh, is coming out in a few weeks, right? Yes. Thank you. April 5th. Um, the Psilocybin Connection, a Psychedelics, The Transformation of Consciousness, Evolution of Life on Planets, an Integral Approach, published by North Atlantic Books, distributed by Penguin Random House, available on all the platforms, Amazon, Google Play, Barnes & Noble. So it, it, it's the hardest thing I've done. It's like, it feels like a lifetime of work. It feels like 20 sure. years of work in many ways yeah. it was, but it was definitely five years of just dedicated writing. Yeah. And it was my dissertation. It's gone through a lot. Um, so it's definitely the, the best gift I've been able to get so far. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was an amazing read. And uh, like I said, the bibliography was amazing. So I could tell how much effort and knowledge that you put into it and synthesis, you know, the knowledge that you synthesized. Um, uh, it's something that I think I'll be going back to uh, on a regular basis. Uh, it's a really good resource. Uh, and I will put links to it in the show notes in the video description. Uh, so uh, just a couple of final questions. Uh, I know it's mm -hmm. uh, kind of lunchtime here, uh, but uh, what's next for you? Let's see. I want to see the process of the book, you know, being birthed and coming out. It feels like I've been in labor for five years. So I just <laughs> want to see it out and make sure the child does good. You know, whether it's through the next seven months to a year, whether it's podcasts, talks, getting the word out. I, I did my job already kind of birthing it, but I want to make sure the transition is, is as good as possible. And, um, you know, as you've mentioned, I've, I've read 75 books just on psychedelics and hundreds of other books to support it. And I think it's far more comprehensive than most of the other material, given that like I'm aware of what else is out there in the field. Um, and it, it feels a lot of the deep human needs, like, like the emergence of humanity and so on. So I think there's a lot of the discussion that can be had around it. I have a private practice is very full book that month. I, I do the journey work in Jamaica. Um, a lot of advising roles um, just asked by synthesis and other training that happens in the Netherlands to come on as an advisor as asked a few days ago. So the schedule is really full in terms of this area. I want to write several more books. You know, I love reading and writing. I should and probably will take a year off of more direct role, gauging in creating a book because I want to receive feedback from this book before mm -hmm. starting the next mm -hmm. project. That being right. said, I've been working another book in my mind for the last two years, mm -hmm. right? So I've already kind of scripted it out and, 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 and organized it. And I want to get to it after I get feedback from this one. Um, I think, I mean, it's the most exciting time to be in this field yeah. and it's just, it's just growing. Like we're not even hitting federal legalization and that's around the corner. And so I feel I'm allowing myself to be very open to be able to adapt yeah. and to respond to the needs as they're arising, like collectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Uh, it is an exciting time. It is. It's very <laughs> exciting. Um, so uh, where can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah, the website is uh, psychedelicevolution.org. That's psychedelicevolution.org. There's a lot of writing, podcasts, talks, background ways to contact me is on there, including ways to get to the book. Yeah. Okay. Well, wonderful. Yeah. Well, Jahan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hard. know I could probably talk to you for quite a bit longer, but it's, yeah. it is lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. I've enjoyed the, you know, the conversations and your specific background, you know, I love yeah. the actual topics that we've been covering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I did. I loved your book. I finished it yesterday and uh, oh. I am going to refer to it. I'm going to tell everyone to go out and get a copy and read it. It's uh, um, uh, it is quite different than a lot of the other books on psychedelics. Um, oh, that was part of my hope. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Jahan, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Very honored. All right. And that's a wrap on episode 34 of Rebel Spirit Radio. 
Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. It only takes a second and your five-star ratings really do help. If you have a moment to spare, uh, consider posting a short but positive review and please consider subscribing. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I've been releasing episodes weekly and would like to continue doing so. I'm also working on creating additional video content for the YouTube channel, and I should be releasing some of that pretty soon. This will include book reviews, educational videos on topics concerning spirituality, the history of religion, and the religious response to the climate crisis. But that extra content takes a lot of time and work. If you would like to support me in creating free and credible material on YouTube and continuing with this podcast, please consider making a one-time donation via PayPal. You can find a link for that in the video description or the show notes. Your support makes this podcast possible. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.